Nice to see everybody. Let's see, Dave in Detroit and Ray in Utica, New York. Emily in Eugene, Oregon. Wonderful. Welcome, Rick, North Coast Repertory Theater. Goodwill in Virginia. Eileen, hello. Shout out to Mechelin. I don't know if I'm saying that right. The Guideposts Foundation in New York. Lisa, Community Solutions in California. And Kaylee from Alberta. Welcome, welcome. All right, nice to see everybody. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Q&A box. And we'll get started in a minute or two. Yes, uh, yes, I thought, so, thought I saw two people from Utica. So connect, connect, who was it? Let's see, and now I can't remember. Uh, Hillary, that was you asking, right? Did I see somebody else? I think, maybe. All right, you're gonna have to find each other. Um, Emily from Wisconsin, nice to see you. Lori from Albany. Um, Sherry or Cherry from in Boone, North Carolina. Um, Nancy in Cambridge. Linda in Indianapolis, Indiana. Let's see, Lauren from Tennessee, nice to see you. Okay, so Emily is reminding us to remember to change your option to all panelists and attendees so we can all chat together, yes. Um, and uh, if, if Becky's on the call, I don't know where my phone is. I think I left it downstairs. I don't know where it is, so um, you can't text me. So um, you can chat to me in the Q&A box um, if there's something important that I need to see. All right, welcome everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, let's see, three o'clock, top of the hour here in New Jersey. It is nice and sunny and warm today. And uh, I'm thrilled you're here in the middle of July. So, um, what are we gonna talk about today? First of all, um, I don't have a guest, so it's just me and you today, which is fun. And so go ahead and open your Q&A box and start putting in any questions you would like to discuss. But I think um, the most important topic that I wanna talk about today, I just did a webinar earlier in the day for Bloomerang. And the topic was, capital campaigns during a pandemic, question mark, um, stop, yield, or hit the gas. I don't remember what we called it, uh, you know, pedal to the metal. And I think that that, you know, raised so many important issues for me about fundraising in general. So the question is, you know, stop, go, yield, proceed with caution, or go, go, go. And uh, you know, I'm wondering what's going on at your organization. So in the chat, why don't you let me know if you are stopped from fundraising, proceeding with caution, or the, the pedals to the metal and you're all in, in terms of fundraising this year. So the question is fundraising in a pandemic? Um, yes, no, what's happening at your organization. So let's see in the, uh, in the chat box what's going on. All right, pedal to the metal I've got from Bronda. Let's see, highly strategic fundraising, good. Uh, a couple pedal to the metals, great. We're five months away from a completed $5 million capital campaign. Pedal to the metal, Sarah, okay. Um, great, Yolanda, moving forward with our fundraising efforts, taking time to review our advancement efforts, great, Linda's fundraising as usual. Um, all right, so Hillary, you've been told to stop per the board, um, but we're working to get back up and running. Yeah, so interesting. We had a couple of board members weigh in, you know, in the webinar earlier, and um, I think I think board members can hold you back and they're nervous and they don't want to fundraise necessarily or they don't feel comfortable. So they um, are probably likely, 
not all of them, I'm generalizing, of course, um, to sort of pull the reins. But let me just read a few more of these comments because I'm, I really want to hear what you're saying before I start talking myself. Um, okay, Carol, not, probably too many little pop-up asks and not enough major gift fundraising. Nancy is pedal to the metal. Uh, Kaylee, all fundraising at full tilt, um, but our campaign took a bit of a delay. Okay, Leticia's proceeding with caution. Um, okay, so good. Full steam ahead, but being very careful as we think about individual prospect strategies. Excellent. Well, okay, so I'm seeing pedal to the metal, but no visits at this time. So no in-person visits, but I hope there's lots of visits like this. So there should be lots of virtual solicitation and virtual conversation. So use the technology, ask your donors, you know, how do they communicate with their kids and grandkids? How do they video chat? And you do the same. So whether it's, um, FaceTime or Zoom or Skype or something else, um, you can do what, what they do best. All right, excellent. Okay, so, um, there's, so thank you all so much for responding. I can't possibly read all the comments yet right now in the, um, in the comments box, but I am trying to scan them. So um, Christopher says, we had one of our most successful second quarters thus far. We're currently doing a virtual 5K walk run. Congratulations, two thumbs up. Excellent. Um, In-person ev events have been postponed. We're now looking at virtual events. Okay, um, so here's the thing. I want you guys to find the courage deep down inside to put the pedal to the metal. Um, for those of you that are still holding back or you have boards holding you back, um, what's happening right now because of COVID, a couple of things are happening. One is um, the playing field is being cleared because all of the small nonprofits, not all of them, small nonprofits, some small nonprofits, some big nonprofits actually are, are failing right now or their boards are holding them back, or an executive director is holding them back. And so the playing field is clearing. And so for those of you guys left in the game, um, there is more room to go, go, go. There are many, many donors who want to help and are looking for a reason to help right now. And so um, they are eager to help. The other important thing to really remember and understand is that this pandemic, has strengthened your case for support like nothing else could, right? The need is great and apparent and vast. I don't care what kind of nonprofit you have, whether it's environmental or arts or healthcare or um, direct service or food or whatever it is, there is a strong, strong need and you can make a very strong case for support for your programs and services. And so, um, so, you know, things are compounding, right? So, so there are opportunities like never before because, because you have needs, programs and services. Maybe you're the need, the demand for your programs and services, for human services, for social services, for food, for housing, for animal shelters, everything skyrocketing, right? Healthcare. Um, senior services, skyrocketing needs, even education, uh, the list goes on and on. And so that coupled with the fact that so many nonprofits honestly are dropping out of the game for a variety of reasons, no shame, no blame, it just is the way it is right now, um, there is an unprecedented opportunity. So I really, really want to encourage you um, to, to pedal to the metal. Right? Honestly, at this point in the game, there's nothing to lose. So you go out to donors and you have conversations and say, listen, um, I don't want to be fundraising right now, but in order to serve all of these people and provide all of these programs, that's what we're doing. That's where the need's at. And so would I be rather, you know, rather be 
implementing programs and services or whatever it is, um, but I'm here talking to you about how you can be a partner with us and so that we can do this. We have to raise more money now than we ever have before. And so I'm not sure what to ask you for, but I'm gonna ask you for a lot and because I, I believe that you want to help a lot and have a big impact. So then you can tell me, we can start the conversation. So anyways, all right, so that's my, that's my opening uh, rant, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, that's, that's our theme for today. I think it's pedal to the metal. We're going all in. Um, so let me read some of these comments here. Um, Jose, we have raised over $2 million to support nonprofits and individuals in our region. Um, in Southern California, also just established a new um, IE Black Equity Fund with a goal of $5 million. Yes. Um, all right. So more resources in the, in the comments section. All right. So, okay. So listen, events, forget events. You know, um, for anybody who's been following me for more than a week or a month or a year, um, you know that I am all about major gifts. Um, one major gift can replace your event income. I don't care how amazing your event is, whether it brings in $10,000 or $100,000 or $100 million, you know, one individual donor can replace that. And so it's just a question of, and a matter of going out and building those relationships. Now, you know, events, whether they come back or not in six months or a year or two years or five years, I don't know. But right now, um, some of you are having successful virtual events. Great. Pivot. I love it. Love the creativity. But the reality is you can go to all your event donors and say, listen, the reality is we're not having our gala this year. We're not having our golf. We're not having our 5K. Um, I'm here instead to ask you to make a straight up contribution because we're, the need is greater than ever. So instead of planning your event, um, try that. Reach out to the people that would come to your, your event and ask them for uh, contributions. Now, Alana, I see executive leadership puts a lot of pressure to host events because they don't know how to do any other type of fundraising. Um, and so... And I can say that with confidence because I've been working with them for years. Um, and so what I will tell you is that, um, and I'm going to get to questions in just a minute, but I will tell you that I've been hard at work in the last month after doing these Q&A calls, these town hall calls since the pandemic started um, in mid-March. I've been doing them every single week since the pandemic started. And what I am working on right now, I realize that I have veered too far away from what you really need. And that is a step-by-step -step program to help you raise major gifts and to raise real significant money. So starting next week, you're going to see me start promoting a program that I've created that's going to incorporate this kind of community town hall call but with videos and lessons and worksheets and step-by-step -step guides so that you can really get back to fundraising fundamentals and beyond. Um, it's not about grant writing. It's not about event planning. It's all about individual donors and raising major gifts because I truly believe that that's where the money is. Um, so anyways, so stay tuned, stay tuned. Um, I'm excited about it. All right. So let's go to some questions in the Q&A box. Um, so Joe says, very interested if your viewpoints are shifting as COVID is now raging, upsetting hopes that we'd flatten the curve and return gradually to something more normal. So listen, Joe, I think, you know, none of us knows what the future holds, right? Um, vaccine or cure or raging raging virus, which is what we seem to be having all over this country right now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so on the one hand, yes, my viewpoints and attitudes and opinions and thoughts shift every day. 
not as fast as the first month. I think the first month we sort of all felt like we were on quicksand and everything changed from day to day. Honestly, now I feel like we're in this for the long haul. Um, whether something changes in the next six, six months or 12 months, I don't know. But my plan is to operate like we are not going to be back in a room with 100 people. I'm not going to be getting on a plane going to conferences. Um, you're not going to be sitting in the living room with donors anytime in the near future. And so what we're doing is pedal to the metal um, in the current environment. That's, I mean, that's, that's what I think right now. That's what I know. Um, all right, Laura, are folks optimistic about plan giving during the pandemic? I'd like to proceed cautiously with long-term donors, but I'm getting pushback. All right, pushback from who? So I'd love to see what you guys think. You know, are you moving ahead with planned giving? I think that the way to raise planned giving with donors right now is to say, you know what? We made a mistake by not doing a lot of planned giving work 10 or 20 years ago, because if we had, we'd be in much better shape today. And I don't know if it's something that you're comfortable talking with, but if you are, I'd love to have that conversation. So, um, you know, you might be getting pushback from board members who don't do any planned giving, who don't know anything about planned giving. Um, your donors who are, are uh, philanthropic and thoughtful and planned about this, they, you know, it's not nearly as uncomfortable for them. Um, they are thinking about it. In fact, I was just talking to a Humane Society yesterday. She says that they've gotten more notifications about bequests um, in the last four months than they've ever gotten before because people are thinking about it. They, they're thinking about their mortality. They're thinking about what happens if the virus gets them. Um, they're thinking about the kind of legacy they want to leave. So I think it is perfectly appropriate with humility and caution to be raising these really important issues. Um, and uh, Michael Rosen has a great blog. I don't know what specifically the post is, but he writes about this. So um, if you want really good material on plan giving, um, how to proceed, he wrote a really good post about a month or two ago. If anybody has it or finds it, you can stick the link in the, in the chat box for us. Okay, uh, let's see, Tracy. Uh, <laughs> you are not sleeping, you already hit your annual goal. Oh my gosh, okay, don't not sleep. Annual goal, is that from January to December or you already hit your goal um, in July for the whole year? <laughs> um, you got to sleep. So I'm not suggesting not sleeping, but I'm glad you're pedal to the metal. So thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, let's see. You mentioned, okay. So um, somebody's asking me anonymously if that I would be bringing these town hall calls to an end. So the good news is I'm not actually ending them. Um, two, th two ways I'm continuing them. One is I have been doing these town hall meetings twice a week for the last four plus months. Um, once with the Capital Campaign Toolkit with my co-founder, Andrea Kilstedt, we do them every Monday at two o'clock. Um, and I've been doing them on Thursdays. And so I am after next week, next week will, I think next week or maybe two more weeks, but next week um, will be the last one. I'll let you know in my email, my weekly emails, don't worry. Um, next week or the week after will be the end of the Thursday ones. But then at the beginning of September, I'm gonna pick back up the Monday ones and I will invite all of you to come over and join us at the Capital Campaign Toolkit and we don't just talk about capital campaigns. So if you're not in a capital campaign, honestly, the, the topics are perfectly appropriate for everybody in this group too. So that's option one, if you wanna continue with me on a weekly basis with a free call. The other way we're gonna do it is I wanna be really more specific, intentional, and have a even tighter community I am gonna start, it's a pretty low low fee, a low entry point. It's gonna be under $200 a month um, to join this new 
major gifts program. And we're gonna have town hall calls and regular small group discussions so that those of you who are really serious about raising major gifts this year um, are pedal to the metal. And so those are the two things that I'm doing. Of course, I will be continuing my blog and all sorts of other free resources and I do free webinars all the time. Um, so anyways, that is, that's what, well, that's what the plan is. Okay. Who's congratulating? Let's see. There's all sorts of congratulations in the comments and I don't know what happened. So I have to go back. Um, all right. So I can't wait to see what, well, I can't find what the comment is, but it sounds like there's some amazing, oh, she met her goal from January to December. Okay. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. All right. Um, Excellent. So this is really, really great. Oh, so Alana, you're asking me, is this instead of my Mastering Major Gifts class? So um, what I'm doing is I'm rebooting and completely revising my Mastering Major Gifts class. So for those of you that are in Mastering Major Gifts right now and have active memberships, you will actually have access to the original content that you have access to now, and you will have access full access to the new content for as long as your existing membership lasts. So if you have another six months or another four months, um, that's how long you'll have access or another 12 months. If you just signed up, you'll have access to all the original material and you'll have access to the new material. Um, but it's being completely rebooted, redesigned and uh, reconfigured. Obviously I'll be addressing things that I didn't address in the old um, course, like virtual uh, you know, video asking and virtual solicitation and all sorts of things like that. Um, all right, let's go back to questions for a minute and then I'm happy to answer any other questions. So Jose, we have focused on a number of COVID related fundraising uh, and just established, um, great. Oh, you're just telling me your goal. Awesome, that is awesome. I'm happy to hear that you've got a big, huge, hairy, audacious goal. Um, Emily, for 10, says, for tentative board members, what are suggestions on easy ways to start getting them involved? We've started small with thank you calls to people who have already donated. Any other ideas? Okay, so town hall, go, go to it in the chat. Um, if, if you um, have involved or engaged your board members, we want to know how. Emily wants to know what you're doing. She's got them making some thank you calls. Honestly, that is, a, that is the best way to start, especially with tentative or timid board members around fundraising, is have them make thank you calls, write thank you notes. So um, either before a board meeting, when they were happening in person was a great time, or right after a board meeting, um, giving them thank you notes or thank you calls to make. Now, of course, they can make thank you calls from home and even write thank you notes from home. So it's a great way to get started. Um, I also love when organizations do a, uh, a mentor-mentee board member program. And so you can have really experienced fundraising board members um, partner up with board members who are newer to your board or more timid about fundraising and show them the ropes, um, have them, you know, join them for a visit or two, you know, even if it's remote Zoom, you know, just introduce them as a new board member or um, somebody who's learning more about the organization or whatever it is. Um, so you can have a shadow mentor program with board members. That's a great way to get board members actively involved. So any type of thanking and stewardship, of course, but also cultivation activities. So what can they do to learn about potential donors and build relationships with them? They can call to provide them an update. They can call to check in on them, see how they're doing during these times, um, and then just introduce themselves. I have give them three questions to ask donors. It, it doesn't even have to be a thank you call or a fundraising solicitation. Just say, hey, you know, I'm going to give you three calls to make or, you know what, even easier, three emails to send because, you know, calls are tough. They may not get through to anybody. It may be frustrating. So how about sending some emails and say three emails to some of our donors or potential supporters and just say, hey, I'm introducing myself as a board member. If you have any questions, 
feel free to reach out. Something like that, just starting small. All right, let's see what we've got going on in the comments. Um, all right, so the first big step, Karen says, was to have board members join in on our virtual chats with the CEO and major donors. They loved it and are looking forward to more. That's awesome. Uh, Kristen says, we're having board members who are parents of enrolled students call other parents not on the board to reach out during this time of isolation to let them know that we're concerned about their family. Yeah, it's a check-in, just making a check-in call. Great. All right. All right. Uh, Melissa, do you think that organizations that aren't providing direct need types of services need to offer something to stay in the game? For example, arts organizations providing virtual concerts, museum tours, et cetera. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear, of course, what others feel, but yeah, I, I do think that you guys need to pivot. You know, arts organizations, I'm not sure that they're, that you're gonna be hosting any events or productions anytime in the near future. And I think that the ones that are staying current and um, relevant are the ones that are providing online, remote, virtual activities. And yeah, I think it's, it's critical. All right, okay. So Barbara says, how can we address the shortfalls agencies will be experienced if federal funds are not provided to each state? So, I mean, that's, that is, you know, a good and tough question. Um, I don't know that, that fundraising in some cases are gonna be able to make up for a lack of federal funds. And so I think it is up to you and your board members and your constituents to start doing what they need to do in terms of calling and you know i know that you can't lobby um but there you know as private citizens there are things that you can do to encourage those federal funds uh, you know i think listen in 2008 when there were severe cutbacks and shortages maybe i'm thinking of the wrong year but um you know yeah, I guess it must have been in 2008 when everything was crashing. You know, people were calling and saying, like, how can we save our nonprofit? Well, if they had started fundraising and doing planned giving and major gifts, you know, a few years before, but if 90% of your budget comes from federal funds and they're eliminated, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I am not sure what what the solution is right now to me what i'm telling every nonprofit is to have an a plan a b plan and a c plan right so your a plan is you raise all the money you need and more what are you going to do your b plan is you raise some of the money or most of the money that you need you know what are what are you going to do in that scenario and your c plan is we don't raise the money we need you know, what are we cutting? What are we eliminating? And what are we doing to prevent that C plan from coming to fruition? Um, you know, as much as I want to say positive and rosy, I'm also, I think, a realist. And, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Not every nonprofit is going to make it through this. Um, if you're not pivoting, if you're not being creative, if you're not hustling, um, as somebody said before, if you're not, not sleeping, <laughs> maybe not that extreme, but it's gonna take a lot of work to get through this. And, um, oh good, Susan, thank you. Um, nonprofits can do a little lobbying, good. Yeah, I didn't wanna get into, you know, I don't, I don't know all the details around that. So, um, but it's important stuff. All right, um, Anonymous again, we are continuing our fundraising efforts and calling current and past donors. How do I get them to call me back? How many phone calls are too many? It is tough. You know, it is tough. So, I mean, I'm assuming that you're also shaking things up. Like every time you make a phone call, send an email if you're leaving a message, right? Um, leave a message and send an email. Hopefully they'll get back to you one way or the other leave on the machine that you're going to try them again tomorrow or the next, you know, in two days and then try again, then probably wait a few weeks. But 
try a different method of entry. So hand write a letter. Um, if you figure out, if you try and figure out, go on LinkedIn and Facebook and figure out which of your board members or volunteers or staff members are connected to that individual. So it may not be you to get through, but maybe somebody else at your organization can get through to that person or would pick up the phone. Um, all right. Um, okay, so let's see. What else do we have? I see I have offended someone and someone is upset with something I just said. Um, and I, you know, so on the one hand, I'm sorry, I certainly didn't mean to offend anybody. I don't even know what I said. She didn't tell me. She just told me she was leaving. Um, but, uh, you know, listen, I'm here to share what my experience and what I see as the situation and it's not going to be the perfect advice for everybody. All right, Allison, as an arts organization, not able to bring artistic programming to patrons and clients, how do we convince donors to still give when we don't know when programming will continue? So Allison, I do think that a lot of your peer organizations have, have pivoted and are providing online programming. Um, it may not be what you hope and want, and you know, it, it may not be your A plan, obviously. Um, the question is, what can you provide until you're reopened? Because honestly, you know, it could be 18 months, it could be three years before we're going to the theater again. And so what, look around at other theaters in the area, around the country, around the world, to see what kinds of creative things that they're doing. And I would try and figure out, you know, if you are going to justify keeping all your staff and keeping your, you know, paying your performers and musicians, you are going to have to provide some sort of ongoing back and forth with your donors. Um, I think probably performing arts centers are, for the most part, are having some of the hardest time um, during this time. But so here's some good news. Here's some good news. That is that your donors, you know, can't wait to get back to the theater. They can't wait. And so they will do anything in their power, probably, to make sure that that happens and that you stay strong. So I think it is going to them with a plan. Tell them what's going on with your staff, what's going on with your performers, what's going on with your classes, what's going on with your productions, um, and make sure that you keep that dialogue open so that they know what, um, what, what is happening, what the plan is. Don't stay silent, don't go underground. Then they'll, they'll think you're either okay or that you're gone. Um, so the more communication you can do, the better. All right, so let's see. Uh, Christopher says, tell us how to refuel before we hit the gas. Some of us have not stopped because of COVID. Some of us are running low on the tank, um, but digging deep and pushing the gas anyways. Yeah, so I'm so glad you asked that. Listen, we could work forever, right? Constantly nonstop. And I think that a lot, a lot of us do in nonprofits, you know, we're, we're running, running, running. We're always short staffed. We're always under resourced. So I do think it is critically important, you know, to take time off to somehow figure out how to decompress. So whether it's establishing a rule at your organization that between 6 PM and 8 AM, you're not responding to emails, no matter how many are piled up. You know, you're not working on the weekends. You do take your vacation time. Um, you know, I think it's critically important. So I'd love to hear from others. What, what are others, you know, whether it's every Friday off in the summer, certainly not lots of nonprofits um, do that. And so please, please, um, you do need to take care of yourself first, because if you burn out, you're not good to anybody. You're not good to your nonprofit, your donors, your clients, um, your constituents, and that, you know, obviously, I don't want to see that happen at all. Um, oh, Susan's adding your family. So, you know, whether it's saying, all right, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do 
these events or these grants or you know, the, there are certain categories of donors that are going to receive bulk communication from us. So as much as I'm saying pedal to the metal, um, I also truly believe, you know, in, in balance, whatever that means, if there is ever any balance. And so everybody's behind. You're doing the best you can. And to me, that is, is good enough, as long as you're being efficient and effective. So there's, there's groups of donors, right? Um, I always say in, in my Mastering Major Gifts class, I tell people that if, if they are responsible for everything, if you're responsible for everything at your organization, grant writing and event planning and marketing and donor database and major gifts, then you can manage a portfolio of about 20 people. So I think part of the problem is that, you know, a lot of development directors put pressure on themselves to be cultivating everybody all the time. And what ultimately ends up happening is that you're cultivating nobody. And because you're just spinning your wheels, spinning your wheels. So, you know, you have your 20 people, maybe your A list and your B list that you're working on calling, that you're handwriting notes to. I mean, well, you're handwriting notes to more people than that. But then there's a group of people, the bulk of people, honestly, that are in your bulk solicitation, your bulk stewardship program. Um, and those, you know, um, those you're sending emails to and you're sending direct mail to and you're having volunteers call, but it's more of a, it's a less of a personalized situation. So um, any other ideas, um, feel free to put it in the, Yes, yeah, Susan says, have self-compassion. COVID is affecting all of us. Um, absolutely. Okay. All right. So, oh, good. So um, let's see. Tamam is asking um, about an A and B list for people who are doing it all, 20 people. But for major gift officers, generally, I think a manageable number of people, if your job is a full-time major gift officer, is 20 people. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Full-time major gift officer is about 100. You know, I've seen lists anywhere from 75 people to, you know, 150 people. Um, bigger than that, you can't manage it. Here's my rule of thumb for knowing what size portfolio of major gift prospects you should be managing. It is the number of people you can actively manage relationships with at a time. So that means um, connecting with them on the phone or in person or video chat at least four times a year. If you're not seeing people, talking to people, exchanging emails and ideas with people at least four times a year, you're not managing them. You're not having a relationship with them. And so um, everybody else needs to be in a more automated program. If you have 200 people in your portfolio or 500 people in your portfolio, which I've seen plenty of times, um, you know, there's three or 400 people that are not getting anything other than bulk solicitations or maybe they're getting called once a year. They're, maybe you're seeing them once a year. That's not a relationship. That's not moving the relationship forward. Um, and so my response to how many people can you manage is how many people can you actively have a relationship with? So are you sending them something once a month? You know, are you connecting with them three or four or five times a year? That's a relationship. All right. So let's see. I want to read some of this in the chat. So everybody take a seventh inning stretch. Everybody's going to pause because I'm behind and I need to read some of these comments. So, you know, one minute of meditation or quiet for one, one minute. Okay, thank you. 
uh, for giving me a little bit of time to catch up. There's so many good comments. That is what I love most about this town hall, honestly. Is that is, is all the rich discussion and um, sharing of resources in the comments section. It's just, it's just amazing. All right, so Kristen says, I have a donor who's deeply connected through her mother and daughter to our organization. She's 94. I've courted her, had lunch, sent flowers, and she keeps giving me 10,000 a year, although last season it was 5,000. How can I get her to talk to me about whether she has a legacy plan for our organization? So listen, um, once donors get to a certain age, you have to be extraordinarily careful about broaching the subject of planned gifts. Um, to me, somebody who's 94 um, may or may not have all of their mental faculties about them, and you need to be extraordinarily careful about um, any perceived or actual coercement. Um, so to me, you know, obviously, ideally, you're talking to people who are in their 60s and 70s about planned gifts, not people in their 80s and 90s. But being that you have this person, what I would do is include her daughter. You said that her, her mother uh, connected through her mother and daughter. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if that's a granddaughter. But anyways, bring the family together to have a conversation, say, listen, you know, this has been an important charity to her for the past five, 10, 20, 50 years. Um, and I wanted to know, you know, one of the things that we're talking with all of our supporters about is a legacy gift and leaving a legacy so that we can be here for future generations. Is that a conversation that you'd be willing to entertain? Um, because then if the daughter um, who I'm guessing, if she has a 94-year-old mother, is in her 60s or 70s. Um, that's the perfect time to start those conversations. And if she's on board with her mother leaving a bequest or a planned gift, um, then it's, um, you know, then it's on the up and up, right? All right. Yeah, okay, so uh, let's see. Um, Cherry says, I love people and genuinely enjoy getting to know them and engage. I hate feeling like I'm starting a relationship with someone just for their money. I don't want to seem disingenuous. How do you fight that feeling? Um, I think that that is such an important question and something that we hopefully don't need to struggle with, but I think that so many of us do, right? And the question is, how to really get, change your mindset so that you think of the relationship with your donors as partnership, partnerships, right? They're not just there as an ATM machine or a wallet or a source of funds, but they're somebody who's actually interested in, in seeing the change in the world that you want to see right? They love and care about the mission as much as you do. And so um, seeing them and having conversations with them as partners, thinking about them as partners for your organization as opposed to donors. Anyways, maybe we should start a movement and change the, the terminology from donors to partners. What if you called all of your donors partners? Instead, I've seen one organization do that. Um, and it was like such an aha moment. Um, you know, what if, what if they're not don't, what if we don't see them as donors? What if they're real true partners for our organization? And I'll tell you a side story that I've probably told a million times. So if you've already heard it, I'm sorry, but I was, do, I was facilitating a board retreat one time and I was talking about cultivation and building relationships with donors. And this um, board member came up to me and she said, you know, what you're talking about is really, you know, it seems to be to be fake and phony because you're just pretending to be friends with people um, so that they donate. So I think, Cherry, that's exactly what you're asking about. 
And I was so taken aback because I really, you know, I don't, I don't feel like, um, I, you know, I was super upset. I don't ever want to be perceived as fake or phony, right? That, those aren't exactly words that you would love to have used to describe yourself. And so I said, listen, um, do you as a board member passionately care about the kids you're serving at this organization? She's like, yes, of course, obviously I do. I said, and does your donor genuinely and truly care about the kids that you're serving at this organization? And she's like, yes, obviously. So I said, well, that's what the relationship is based on. It's not that you're best friends. It's not that you have to celebrate birthdays together. You're not going to celebrate anniversaries together, but you're going to connect around a meaningful and important issue to both of you. And that's the genuine part. And so it's not just about money. It's about connecting um, over an issue and a community issue that you both care passionately about. Um, all right. Great. So let's, let me look in the comments. Excellent. Okay, so people are saying that they've called their donors part of the family or partners or uh, supporters. But even more than supporters, I think partners is really, you know, you're, you're doing this work together. Like the donors, want this work done, but they couldn't do it without you because they're not going to go out there and do the, the hard work that it takes to change the world. What they have is financial resources. Um, you couldn't do it without them and they couldn't do it without you. So it truly is a partnership and it would be great if we could think about it that way. All right, so let's see. Um, Rick saying, think about how much you want to share the things you love about life, favorite movie, favorite book, favorite nonprofit. You aren't after the money. You're trying to connect people that care about a cause that's important to you. All right. Excellent. All right. We're going to start a revolution here. Partners instead of donors. Let's do it. I better write that down. Um, partners. Maybe I'll blog post about that. Um, maybe I'll write a blog about that. Uh, partners, not donors. Okay. Good. All right. What else you got for me? Um, so that's all the questions that are in the chat box. So I need to, or the question box. So if you want to add one, um, I have time for one or two more. Linda says, when I make friends with donors, I never think of asking or expecting a donation. I make a connection with them that evidently makes them a donor of importance. I can't think of many how many times I actually asked for money. They just know because of our relationship. So, um, so on the one hand, yes, I don't want you to assume that they know. Um, Linda, I'm so happy it's worked for you, but I do wonder if they might have given more if you were more specific about what the needs are, or maybe you were specific about what the needs are um, without asking for money. You can say, listen, do you want to help um, get three kids off our waiting list, or do you want to help um, provide... A social worker and then they if if you've done your job really really well in describing what the needs are they can say yes I want to help you know how does that work or how much does that cost what do I need to do so all right uh, yes okay so um, Susan says I use the word join me in my communications helps get over the hump of the ask yeah join me in making sure these programs and services continue all right, so Yolanda's asking, there was a question in the chat about soliciting parents during this time of COVID who may feel that their students are not getting the full benefit of an in-class experience and no fall sports programs. I'd be interested in, your, in that um, question. So listen, I think that everybody understands that these are the craziest times. Um, you know, it, it's true. I think you can say, listen, it costs a lot more for us to provide this online experience. We have to make sure that everybody has an electronic device, that everybody's connected to the internet, that our teachers have new um, teaching methods and training. And so that's what you're fundraising for to improve the distance learning experience. So that may be one tactic. Um, you might also, well, 
Um, I think that, you know, you can say that you are fundraising so that the, the sports and the extracurricular activities can resume as soon as you're possibly able and that in the meantime, you're going to be doing your best to provide other opportunities. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I would like to hear what others say about that. All right, and Tina says, what do you think of naming a legacy plan giving society? I've been tasked by a consultant to start one, yet yesterday in a webinar heard others in the industry doing away with them. Same question for monthly giving club. Thoughts? All right, I'll turn that one over to the town hall, the, to the um, hive mind, if you will. So are you naming your legacy plan giving society? What about your monthly giving club? I'm curious. Um, all right, so Rick is responding to um, the last question. Uh, where did it go? Um, oh, there was an essay in today's New York Times um, talking about what schools and teachers need during this time. I like the way he framed it and sharing with educators and my family. All right. Excellent. So Susan says we call our monthly quarterly donors as sustainers. Um, all right, excellent. Listen, um, I, I think there are pros and cons to um, naming a monthly giving club or having a monthly giving club. Um, I don't feel honestly strongly in one way or the other. I think that if it works for the culture of your organization, go for it. It motivates some people. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you leave somebody off the list or you miss somebody, um, that can be difficult. So if you have good data management, then um, it may be worth it. I think it's, it's fine to have it. It's fine not to have it. So, all right. Listen, you guys, it's 3.50. Um, let's, let's do the last five minutes of encouragement and words of wisdom and positive thoughts and vibes. Um, I will tell you that I am super, super excited about this program that I'm going to be launching next week because um, as much as I love, love, love these town halls, I do think we're sort of all over the place and not being as strategic as I'd like. I'd like to take you on more of a journey with me. And so that making sure that everybody is really focused on raising major gifts and building those relationships with individuals. And by creating a program, um, I'm gonna be able to do that as opposed to just answering random questions. I've, I've loved having this community, but I'm transitioning it to this, this more of a, a targeted program. Um, and you can also join the free calls that will be starting up again on Mondays um, through the Capital Campaign Toolkit, and it'll be a lot like this. Um, so I think that that is, that is where I want to leave us, but let's, let's think of all the things, um, funny shows you're watching, good books you're reading, let's, let's hear it before we wrap up. Um, let's see, okay, so Hillary's responding about the monthly giving club, many dropped out, many stayed in, uh, survey the people you'll be asking to join. Good. All right. Excellent. Um, let's see what else we want to say. Happiness is the new rich. I love that. Who said that? Linda. Happiness is the new rich. Inner peace is the new success. Health is the new wealth and kindness is the new cool. Ah, uh, my thoughts to share. Linda, thank you. Thank you. That just let us um, end on such a happy note, but we're getting so many more. So keep, um, let's see, excellent. Um, all right, Emily's rec recommending Netflix's Mystic Pop-Up Bar. I don't know what that is. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, Susan says grants are coming in, it's, it's exciting. Excellent, um, great. <laughs> Karen's watching Friends again. That's awesome. Um, and Donna completed a thousand piece puzzle. Um, yes, yeah, Susan, I'm watching Schitt's Creek right now. I'm in the final season. I had never watched it before, but in the last four months, I've watched Schitt's Creek and I'm laughing every day. Um, all right, excellent. Uh, Mexican Gothic. 
Uh, excellent by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Excellent. I'm always looking for new books. Oh, Gary, enjoy the small victories. Let's see. Uh, car bombs to cookie tables. I don't know what that is, Nancy. That's a book you're recommending, I think. Excellent. All right, listen, you guys, this has been awesome. I will see you next week. Um, I don't know if I'm doing this once or twice more next week for sure. So join me. I have um, a guest coming um, and it's going to be awesome and uh, have a great week and I'll see you next week. Bye guys.